For this video, I got in touch with D-Train's original maker, Christopher Mayer, who kindly provided me with a lot of fascinating information about the map and the early stages of Counter-Strike's development. He was one of the owners of Barking Dog Studios, who were already working on other Valve games such as Team Fortress and Deathmatch Classic. They comprised of 40 employees altogether, but were split into two teams. CatDog being the larger site that worked on Homeworld Cataclysm at the time, and PopDog being the smaller FPS team that were called in to help with Counter-Strike when it ran into some trouble. You see, Min, aka the Goose Man, was employed by Barking Dog Studios at the time. You may also know that he was one of the original makers of Counter-Strike and was responsible for developing it during the early betas. However, he was struggling to balance the game's development with his own education. So the FPS team at Barking Dog Studios was called in for Beta 5 to assist him in fulfilling his vision of what the game should become. Here's an early overview for Beta 5 that they worked on, though this plan later changed a bit. They essentially reworked the code and provided the game with new weapons, maps and models. Chris, under the alias Cancer Boy, was the lead designer of the Pop Dog segment of Barking Dog Studios and D-Train was his map. He immediately knew that he wanted a train theme. Barking Dog Studios offices at the time were located in Gastown, Vancouver, with a view right into the train station. Indeed, many of the map's textures were taken straight from the station, located just behind the company's offices. At the time, he was inspired by Unreal Tournament and wanted the map to be based on a moving train, with the teams fighting inside and on top of the carriage of a train as it tore down the tracks. It's worth noting that this wasn't originally meant to be a diffuse map. However, he quickly ran into difficulties with the project, mostly from Counter-Strike's more realistic style that made it difficult to situate the gameplay on a train with convincing scale. He got it working, but unfortunately, it didn't perform well in playtests. With half the development time used up on this original idea, he made the difficult decision to scrap it and to start again. In just 15 minutes, he had sketched this layout, which was the basis for the new version. You can already see similarities with the final map, but at the same time, there were also a lot of differences. With the train station being a viable target, he wanted this new train map to be based on the Diffuse game mode, which had only been out for weeks at this point. His plan was to have two bomb targets that the terrorists could get to and to set up quickly. Compared with Dust, which was rather open, he wanted Train to be more about close quarters combat with many choke points and with less emphasis on sniper action. He also wanted to ensure that the sites were close enough that the CTs would still have time to rotate from one to the other once the bomb had been planted. This sounds fairly obvious now, but remember, the Diffusal game mode was first released only a month and a half before Train was. The first playable version was built in a single day. Each day for the following three weeks before release, the map would be developed further, with textures for it being created by Corey Lake, an artist at Barking Dog Studios at the time. Near the end of every day, they'd render the map and would playtest the latest version with Pop Dog's 10 employees, sometimes extending the invitation to the whole company. Development on Train was unusually fast and came together very naturally. Chris describes the process as channeling design rather than creating it. Soon it was ready to be released as part of Beta 5, which launched two days before Christmas 1999. The other map Barking Dog Studios worked on at the time was CS Back Alley, which you may remember was also featured in CSGO for a while as part of Operation Vanguard. However, Christopher doesn't get credit for this one. Instead, Back Alley's development was attributed to Jamie McTaggart, another member of Barking Dog Studios. Due to complications with Back Alley's development, the team didn't quite make the target and they spent Christmas time in crunch mode. Counter-Strike was then officially bought by Valve and Min employed by them. Barking Dog Studios then became Rockstar Vancouver and produced the Bully games, as well as Max Payne 3. Back to D-Train. The map contained a number of audio cues to give players hints as to where the enemies were. The jet engine would activate if somebody was in the sniper nest in middle. There's also a secret sound around the aptly named Ivy, though it plays on a time delay. A member of Barking Dog's Cat Dog segment, Chris Stewart, designed the Pop Dog logo which can be found sprayed on the side of some of the carriages, with the text Pop Dog next to it. This bit of the map is still known as Pop Dog to this day. It's an obscure reminder of the company that originally made this map. Oh, and if you hide under the carriage in the original, then you'll hear a muffled sound of a dog barking. The map had a bug where the train's wheels didn't quite touch the car, leaving a tiny pixel gap that players could use to cheat by seeing and shooting through. At the time, Valve didn't have access to the map file and they contacted Chris, informing him that players were cheating on it. He gave them access to the map to allow them to make changes to it, as it had become a popular competitive map by this point. The map didn't get a Condition Zero version. Instead, it only includes the original again, which makes my life easier. Since now we can move on to the source version. Chris was consulted by Turtle Rock for this version of the map, with this being the last time he had a say in the map's development before Valve took over completely. This wasn't one of the originals for the game though. It wasn't added until the 25th of February 2005, three months after the game came out. I always thought of it as quite a pretty map, full of rounded shapes and pretty details including a dead guy near T-Spawn, similar to that in Nukes at the time. It was always a popular pick for the massive 40-man T-side servers for some reason. 
I decompiled the map and looked for easter eggs. You know, like pop dogs or whatnot. Couldn't find any. Source's version of Train seems fun free. And do you know how many updates it got? Two. The first was the following month, which updated a few of the clip brushes. And the second was a year and a half later, where it became the fourth map to receive the HDR lighting update, after Nuke, Militia and Dust1. It then all seems to go quiet until the orange box update, where all of the maps got this feature. Maybe then it got another update of sorts. I don't know. Don't really care. Let's move on to CSGO. The transition to our favourite version of the game was sort of a middle-sized update. As in, it wasn't a total overhaul, clearly they ported the CSS version across, but did bother to take some time to clean up some of the areas, to replace the worst textures, and to add some prettier lighting and effects where needed. I noticed a few Russian decals and details as well, which the source version lacked. The train carriages were all updated with boxier designs that provided more solid leg cover, but they could still have been better. But at least now they weren't things for players to crawl underneath, which simplifies things somewhat. Oh, and Bombsite A was shifted from this train here to the middle of the outside area and had a load of extra barrels added for cover. An extra balcony bit was added to the other side of the site as well. All in all, it became very complicated when compared with Source. The beginning of Train's journey within CSGO is somewhat complicated. There are signs that it received updates even before the game's official release, based on playtesting during the beta stage. If you really, really want to see how bad this was back then, then you can enable CSGO's beta in Steam like so. In early betas, there was a T-spawn intersecting a pillar, inaccurate radar, and worse ladders and bot pathfinding around the sites. At the game's release, however, there were three different versions of the map at the same time. There's the standard train, short train, which was for demolition mode and only contained a small bit of the map for people to play on, and train SE. This stands for Simplified Edition. It was a short-lived idea by Valve to have a version of each map for competitive play. These simplified the graphics to improve visibility and frame rate. As I said, this wasn't used for long because I guess they discovered that having multiple versions of every map was a hassle to keep updated, and they just decided to try and combine the best of both worlds into a single version for everyone to play. You can see from these comparisons that the simplified edition lacks any sort of distant fog at all to help with visibility and features no background sounds, overhead cables or smoke coming out of the chimneys, which I assume is to improve FPS. But there's one more use for these old maps. Since the big train update in 2014, which I'm sure you're aware of, the original radar overview has been lost, overwritten by the newer version with the same name. Or at least, I thought it had been. However, since Train SE has a slightly different name, it retains the old radar style, helping to preserve a bit of CSGO history that nobody particularly cares about. Anyway, the earliest versions of Train are a bit fuzzy since the workshop only came to Steam after CSGO was released. According to the upload number, this is the oldest version of the map, but unfortunately you can't subscribe to it since it's reserved for the official version which is obviously now the new train. So the earliest version of the map that we have access to and can play if we want is this one, which was in the game up till August of 2013. Meaning that according to the patch notes, this already had less fog, better grenade collisions and other minor improvements over the original, original version that we can no longer access. The August 2013 update contained many useful changes, all listed here. This is the final, definitive version of the old map design. So if you want to experience what the map used to be like before the big update, then subscribe to this one. Most of it was to simplify cover and to improve visibility and clipping. But I think that even when making these improvements, Valve knew that they only served as temporary fixes to tide the map over until its big update over a year later. On the 1st of July 2014, CSGO got a large update. Train itself wasn't updated, but was involved in several ways. For a start, they introduced a reserve maps pool and placed Train in it, hiding it out of sight of the main game somewhat. This was also the release date for Operation Breakout and a new penetration system for the game which Valve demonstrated in this guide, which sneakily included a screenshot of an unknown map which people soon identified as being a new version of Train. Things went quiet for five months, when suddenly in December of 2014, almost two years ago I might add, the new version of Train was released. This was exciting. Sure, we had had completely new maps before, like Overpass. We had been given new versions of maps from earlier games, like Cobble and Vertigo. But this was the first time that a map already included in Global Offensive had had a complete facelift. And clearly by doing this, Valve signed an unwritten contract to do the same to every other map in the game that had remained almost the same since Source, like Nuke and Inferno. But there was a problem. Game breaking. You could use these birds to escape from the level's confines. I mean, as bad as this exploit sounds, it didn't change the gameplay too much. Most rounds, the pigeons didn't even spawn, and even when they did and were exploited against their will, 
it only lets terrorists explore the area along T spawn, so it didn't really help them to win the round at all. But that's besides the point. This map was broken. Within just a day or so, Valve updated the map to remove a few bomb stuck points and a one way wall bang. They changed the clip brushes on the crates at Bombsite A a little bit as well. Look at them go. Oh, and sadly, they also removed the pigeons. But the legacy won't be forgotten, since Valve erected a new sign to remember them by with a text underneath saying, Don't step on birds. This is how Valve admits their mistakes, guys. In dark humid signs embedded around their levels. But that first update was just a knee jerk reaction to the pigeon stomping and a few day one bugs. About a week later, it got a more substantial update to change gameplay somewhat. Ladder room was widened, T spawns were pushed back to delay their rushes, a few more C4 stuck spots were removed, and collision models on train bumpers were updated. There was a pixel exploit here that let CTs hide from view whilst sniping terrorists attacking bombsite B. This was blocked up with this update as well. In this video here, a YouTuber pointed out that the sun angles were all wrong. Be sure to subscribe to him, he's awesome. In response to this, Valve updated the sun's position in the sky. Thank you, Valve. Train got another update the following month in January 2015 with optimizations and a longer T spawn buy zone so that they could buy stuff on the move. But the focus of this update was the introduction of the chroma case and new knife finishes. This whole major train renovation caused an unexpected complication. Short train was removed for a while, which made getting one of CSGO's achievements impossible. This was fixed at the end of March, along with the largest update that this new map would see. Just before April of 2015, it was promoted from reserves to active map pool, replacing Nuke as it went away for a facelift. On top of this, the map received a number of gameplay changing adjustments based around Adren and Cotton suggestions. I finally noticed what can be described as optimizations, notably removing props like the TB that was in Sniper's Nest, Weeds in Connector, and a lot of detail around Bombsite B. I guess the map looks less pretty as a result, but I doubt that anybody cares that much. Bombsite A saw some of the largest changes to gameplay. The site was moved towards CT spawn and a new train carriage added to make the majority of combat more close ranged. The grabber on the crane was moved out of the way even more. I mean, it wasn't obstructing vision even from Sniper Nest, but I guess it could have blocked grenades in some situations. But is that really such a bad thing? I don't know. All I know is that they moved it. This site is so different now that you pretty much have to relearn everything from scratch. T entrance to A got some changes. The left hand side got widened to give them more room to manoeuvre and a pallet got placed here to allow them to contest the tops of train carriages. The dumpsters in Ivy were moved, CT spawns were prioritised and collisions at the top of ladders were removed? This is an interesting one. I couldn't find any difference in Bombsite A at least, though the ladders here have since become known as a problem that Valve has yet to fix, often disrupting movement as you try to latch onto them, so clearly this fix didn't solve everything. Since this major update there have been two more minor ones, the first fixing yet another ladder bug near Bombsite A and filling in the train grooves so that grenades can't get stuck in them and inflict zero damage. From what I could see, the grooves were already filled in, but I noticed the train carriages had a lot more clipping, so maybe they meant that the grenades would get stuck under these and not cause damage. Or not. The latest update was in October of 2015, over a year ago, which fixed a spot where C4 could get stuck on Bombsite A and an unintentional boost in the same area. I'm assuming it was this spot here. Lil. And this brings us up to date with Train's long and illustrious history, as one of its most popular diffuse maps since early in Counter Strike's history. Who knows what's next for it? As for Chris, well, now he's in charge of his own gaming studio known as Hellbent Games, who have 20 employees and have been around for over a decade. You can check them out in this video's description. He's still good friends with Valve and its employees, as well as the legendary Goose Man, who he still meets with sometimes. He looks back at his time on Counter Strike very nostalgically, missing the days where it was a simple case of building and shooting and shooting and building. But Train's legacy lives on and in surprising places. Chris has a tattoo of Barking Dog Studios on his shoulder, for example. And here's the car he now drives about in. Thank you Chris for helping me with this video and for documenting a bit of the game's history that could otherwise have been lost forever.